<laughs> the topic of this lecture is, is this symbol. Can anyone tell me what it's called? Ouroboros. Ouroboros, exactly. Right, so, so this one here um, is from an anime show that I watched when I was 11 uh, in 2001. Um, but this symbol is much, much older than that, significantly older. Uh, so this one goes back about 400 years, Ouroboros. Um, so this was painted by Michael Meyer. So he was an alchemist in the early 1600s. So the alchemists were concerned with uh, the Philosopher's Stone, which is a, basically a, a symbol of, of theological wholeness. It was about transcendence. Um, but they were also very concerned with matter and, and, and the transformations that matter takes place, it, transformations that take place in matter, rather. And they were deeply, deeply concerned with what makes matter alive. Right, that this was their question. What is the relationship between matter and spirit? What makes matter alive? Right? And so this is an ecology class, and so I'm going to be answering that question. What makes matter alive? And the answer that they came up with was this symbol, or that was one of the answers that they came up with. Right? And, and so um, let me just keep going. Right? Here's, here's another more, more recent Ouroboros. Right? This is Walt Disney animation with Mickey Mouse. Um, so. Uh, what I'm going to do in the next half hour or so, right, is try to convince you that this Ouroboros symbol is absolutely essential for understanding the biological world, right? It's not just like some, some weird, like, esoteric religious symbol, like, this is a metaphor that tells us what it means to be alive, right? So that's, that's where we're going to go. Um, so I'm going to keep going with a little bit more history about this symbol, right? So this is the oldest Ouroboros that I am aware of. I took this pet picture, picture in the ancient Egypt exhibit in the Met. Um, so it's from pre-dynastic Egypt, meaning it's over 5,000 years old. Um, so it's, it's quite old. And this is, this is about the oldest like, stone art artifacts that we have. We don't really have artistic artifacts more than like 6,000 years. Um, but there's every reason to think that this symbol of a serpent eating its own tail is significantly older than that. If you do comparative mythology and, and look at the oral histories of, of our indigenous peoples around the world, virtually every creation mythology starts with a serpent. Right? So here's a creation mythology uh, from the Norse Edas of the 13th century. Uh, this is a more modern image. I just pulled this up of deviant art. Uh, but what you see here is uh, Yggdrasil, the world tree who is surrounded by this serpent eating its own tail. Here's another image of it. So the serpent's name is Dorbumandur. And uh, what I wrote there, the serpent consumes itself for all eternity until Ragnarok, which is the apocalyptic battle at the end of the world. So this is, this is sort of indicative of, of what we see with Ouroboros imagery throughout mythology. The, the Ouroboros is linked to the tree of life and is linked to eternity, sort of endless cycles, and then also destruction, right? The end of the world, this sort of like paradox of this serpent that's eating its own tail. It's a, it's a deeply disturbing image if you, if you imagine you know, consuming your hand or your foot or something. Like it's, not, it's not necessarily pleasant, but it captures something about what life force is, right? So what's next? Oh, right, this tree, right? You've all seen this one, right? So what we can say as, as evolutionary biologists is that, no, wrong one. These two trees, right, the serpent and the tree here from Norse mythology, and the serpent and the tree here from Hebrew mythology, they share a common ancestor, right? We see these mythological themes, they're phenotypically similar, they have the same elements, they must have a common ancestor. So you can do the same thing with mythology that you can do with, with any, any kind of living system. Um, and so in, in this particular mythology, the serpent has been cast down, it, it's defined as evil, Right? And the tree of life is this forbidden thing, whereas in, in this mythology it's a little bit different. But in both you have this link between the serpent and life, and that's what I'm trying to explore. Right? But of course the tree of life that I'm mostly concerned about as a biologist is this tree of life. Right? You've seen this before? Um, so we have the metazoans and the fungi and the archaeas and, and all the rest. Um, so what I'm going to do for the rest of the lecture, so we've, we've, we've skipped the mythology portion now. So for the rest of it, I'm going to be highlighting certain points on this tree of life, say, where's my mouse? Okay, there's one. Oh, you can't see it. Damn, I should have a pointing thing. Um, you know, so I'm going to go to different points on this tree and, and tell you a few stories about some biological creatures. And, and make the argument that they are an Ouroboros, or that show, show you how the Ouroboros is located at all these places on the tree of life. Ready? Okay. Um, so does anyone know what this is? Yeah. It's a lichen, yeah. Um, so a lichen is really special because a lichen isn't actually one thing. It's two things, right? So if I go forward, 
Um, so a lichen is actually a symbiotic association of two kinds of creatures. There's a fungus, right, which, not a mushroom, but I put a mushroom there because that's typically what we think of as fungus. And an alga, <laughs> right, so we typically think of alga as marine creatures. But the, the lichen and fu the, the alga and fungus that are in lichens are, are, are totally distinct from these. These are just sort of stereotypical images. And they live in a deep, deep, deep relationship. Right, and the relationship works like this. Let's say you're out in the Pacific somewhere, you have a volcanic explosion, right? So you have this new island, comes out from nothing, and it's just bare volcanic rock. There's nothing that anything could live there. Um, the first kinds of creatures that are going to find this island are these little lichen spores. They're floating around in the atmosphere and they land, and they're like, oh, rock, great. <laughs> um, and because the fungus can do something special that very few other creatures can, which is it, it can secrete these digestive enzymes that will actually break down the rock, right? So the fungus uses its body to break down the rock to make bioavailable minerals, right? So the rock turns into sand, right? And then the alga uses those minerals to build its own body, right? And alga have this photosynthetic machinery in them. That's, that's what allows them to keep going, right? So the alga builds its body out of these minerals, and then it captures some sunlight, converts it, converts, what is it? Uses its body, convert carbon dioxide and water into sugar, right? So it makes sugar. And then it takes that sugar and it feeds it to the fungus. And then the fungus makes more enzymes, breaks down more rock, right? And, 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 and the lichen body grows. And then eventually when the lichen dies, it'll decompose and produce a little bit of soil. And then you can have more complex plants come. And this is ecological succession. All right, so, so now there's, there's this question, right? So how, how is lichen lichen orbors? Anyone here to tell me? Come on, you must have guesses. Yeah. It, um, and then it like returns to how it started after its life cycle is complete. Yeah, it returns to how it started as its life cycle is complete, and... I was going to say, do the two different organisms that live in this species, uh, this giant com combination, like, kind of feed off each other? Yeah, yeah, I mean, quite literally. Like, the, the fungus is, is like, the, the alga is, is making this body, and then the fungus is digesting it, right? It's, so it's making these products, and, and it, all of the things that it makes goes directly to the fungus. So, like, quite literally, they are consuming the products of the other, so they're, they are self-consuming. Um, but, so here's this paradox, is you have them being self-consuming, but you don't actually get death, right? You get reciprocal creation, like they're both consuming the other, but the process is the growth of the creature. So, so this, is, this is one of the messages that the Ouroboros gives us, is that death is not, is not the kind of inherent end that we typically think about it in the Western world, right? Where, where time is this linear thing. Um, death is, is just part of this cycle of renewal that is perpetually happening. So. Now we're going to go back to our tree of life. Right? There's a different, different image. There's a lot, all of these different images of the tree of life. Um, the two that I gave you aren't actually particularly great. But what I like about this one is that it lets me focus on this right here. Right? You can't really see what they say, but it's an interesting shape. So you notice how all of these branches, they're, they're branching. Right? The, 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 the word for it is ramifying. Right? So you have a, a trunk. And then it's branching, it's branching, and branching. Oh, what's happening over here? Right? What you actually have is branches fusing together. Right? And there's a formal world word for this. It's called anastomosis. Right? It's the fusing of branches. And it happens all over the place. We don't typically think about it because when we learn evolutionary theories, oh, it's survival of the fittest, and you learn about all these different speciation mechanisms. But symbiosis is just as important, or if not more important, as a, a way of producing evolutionary novelty and new species. Right? So I'm going to talk about this anastomosis event. Uh, because it's sort of the, the basis of, of everything that is alive today. Um, so it's called endosymbiosis. Has anybody heard of endosymbiosis before? Yeah. So uh, what's, what's the basic idea of endosymbiosis? It's that one organism engulfs the other and that they live in a mutualistic relationship. Yeah, exactly. Right, so what we can see here is, right, in the beginning, you've got two, two kinds of cells. You've got this big big one, you got this little green one. But it's the little green one is the ancestor of a chloroplast. So it's, it's this photosynthesizing creature, very similar to the alga that we were showing, I was showing you in the lichen. And actually the logic of this relationship is going to be exactly the same as the logic of the relationship with the, with the lichen. So you have this free living cyanobacterium that can photosynthesize it. Um, and that means that it's, it's very appealing. Right? Like it's, it's just like this big fat cow wandering around and if you could go, if you have the big cell membrane that can do it, you can go and eat this little cell Like you're going to do that, right? And then you're going to make a living. Um, and so that's what happened. For millions of years, you have these predator-prey relationships, or maybe it was a parasite relationship where the, the cyanobacterium is like getting inside and sucking all the nutrients dry or whatever it is. Um, 
So you have this predator-prey relationship, and then something happens, right? We can, so let's anthropomorphize that a little bit, right? So, so the big one eats the little one, and the little one says, hey, hey, you can eat me, but, but don't, don't completely digest me yet, right? Like, here's the deal. Let me live inside you. Keep me safe from all those other guys that want to eat me, right? And make sure that I have enough water, and have enough sunlight, and have enough minerals, right? So give me all the resources that I need, and what I'll do, I'll transform that sunlight into sugar for you. And you can have all the sugar you could ever want to eat, and you can build your body. Right? And of course it didn't go like that. It was, it was a very long, drawn out evolutionary thing where like, there was a lot of death along the way. But, but this, is, this is the Cliff Notes version, right? And so this, this deal was struck where you have two, formerly two independent creatures, one, two, right? And at the end of this process, you have a eukaryotic cell, right? This, this symbiotic merger of two individuals, right? And we have really good evidence for this, right? So here um, we know that chloroplasts have two membranes. Right, so this, this membrane thing is really important when you're trying to think about like, what, what is an organism. Like being able to tell inside from outside is really, really critical. And chloroplast has two membranes, because it has its own original membrane, and then it has the membrane that it, it picked up when it was phagocytized by the bigger cell. And those two membranes are, are really critical for the process of photosynthesis. They create like this sort of electrochemical gradient thing. Um, so, so the physiology of the chloroplast is contingent on like, the way that it was consumed by its host. Chloroplasts have their own DNA. Right? So that's really strong evidence to say that they used to be independent creatures and now they're not. Right? But they're really not. Like at this point, like if you took any cell in the world, like you go out there, take the chloroplast out of the, that holly or whatever it is, right? the, the, the cell would immediately die. Right? The chloroplast would immediately die. There's no way that these things could live independently anymore. They're totally, totally codependent. So codependent that you might as well call them the same creature, the same cell. But they're, they're still two things, right? And so this is... We go back, right? What's the next step? I don't, I don't want to be behind this desk, so I'm just going to do it this way. Um, so here's my next question, right? So how is endosymbiosis like the orgorus? Similar answer to the last one. Anyone, anyone want to offer up a few words? Yeah. Just like once again, it's, I guess, relying on each other to, for its own survival. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. It's relying on each other for its own survival. And in both cases, they are literally consuming each other. And, and, and through the process of self-consumption, you actually get bodies being built. Okay, so now we're gonna do one more example in this theme before we move on to a slightly different theme. Um, so this. Uh, so this is an image of teosinite, which is ancestral corn. So this is what the corn plant looked like maybe 5,000 years ago, right? And this is what the corn plant looked like today. So how did this happen, right? How did, how did this transformation occur? Well, Let's imagine if our ancient Teosinite could talk and, and it was having a conversation with some early hunter-gatherer, right? The hunter-gatherer finds it and starts chowing down on those seeds and, and the Teosinite's not pleased, right? Because it's, those seeds have put a lot of energy into them. It wants to reproduce through all these things. So the Teosinite says, wait, wait, wait. You can eat me, but don't eat all of me. Take some of these seeds home, right? To, into, your, into your domain and uh, protect them. Make sure that they have enough water and enough minerals and enough sunlight and make sure that all those other creatures that want to eat them don't. Right? And in return, I'll transform that sunlight to sugar for you and you can eat as much as you want. Right? It's precisely the same deal. And like literally the same deal because if you look inside any of these cells, you'll see those chloroplasts that were endosymbiosized two billion years prior. Right? So we have this pattern repeating and repeating and repeating where you know, so, so that you can see how much the corn has changed. It's a little less obvious how we have changed, but we have. Uh, our digestive systems have changed dramatically from, from our chimp ancestors. And like, even, even in the last like, 10,000 years, we're, we're producing more amylase in our saliva. We have extra amylase genes for digesting starch, which is you know, what's in these cereal grains. So our bodies are changing, like deeply changing, due to this relationship that we have formed with the corn. And there's no question that the corn's bodies have changed as well. Right, to the point where you, could not, you couldn't just like, take some, some corn seeds and scatter them in a field and be like, okay, corn, good job, like, you can make it, like, it just it wouldn't happen. Right? So once again, we have this completely codependent relationship where human society is dependent on these cereal grains, the cereal grains are dependent on us, and the result is this, this explosion of productivity where there are more humans on the planet by like 100,000 million times more humans than, than when there were when the first human was, was planting these first teosinite seeds. Um, right, so, one more time, right, I think you're getting the pattern now, but, uh, 
how is agriculture like the oral progress, right? So, um, I won't wait for the awkward silence, but you get the idea, right? Is that we, we are, we're consuming the products of the plants, and, and like, so we make fertilizers, right? So we, we mine the things, and we make all these nitrogen fertilizers, and we give them to the plants. How do we get energy to do that? Well, because we're eating the plants in the first place, right? So you have, you have this energy cycle where we get energy from them, we use that energy to produce products for them, give them those products, and then they give us more energy, right? So there's, there's this, this self-consumption that's happening at the heart of our society, right? Everything that makes human society works, works because of this relationship. Um, but I don't want to give you the idea that, that this Ouroboros symbol is, is just about literal consumption, right? Because it's actually, it's a lot deeper than that. Um, so I showed you these three sort of agricultural things where you, you have on the cellular level you've got endosymbiosis and then you have lichens which is like one evolutionary branch and then agriculture is another. Um, but this concept of the Ouroboros, of this, this self-consuming cycle or, or self-affecting cycle uh, is, is, is much more broad. So <laughs> let's move on to another kind of example. Uh, these guys, what are these guys? Beavers? Beavers, yeah. So they're beavers. So what do beavers do? They make dams, right? So. How did this dam get here? Like, what's, what is going on with all, you know, all this stuff that the beavers are doing? Um, so I think these slides are a little bit out of order. Let me, yeah, so niche construction. I'm going to turn back to that. Um, so here's, here's what happens when a beaver makes a dam, right? So you, you, start, you start with A, and, and you just have, have a, a stream, right? And, it, and it's straight. And then the beaver comes in and puts a dam, and, and the stream <coughs> starts moving, and it gets more meandering. And you have some different kinds of trees coming up. And in the end, by F, you have a totally different ecosystem. Totally different ecosystem, right? So, so the beavers are, are massively modifying their environment. And they're modifying their environment to suit their bodies, right? So let's go back to this image of beaver, right? So look at that. So how did, how did this beaver come to be with its, you know, webbed feet and this, like, great, great tail for slapping mud? and these like big, big gnawing teeth for cutting down trees. Like it seems like it's totally perfectly adapted for living inside a beaver dam. But how, like, how, did, how did that begin? Right, so if we look here, I'll show you a picture of a, a beaver ancestor. Yeah, I really should have not had this order here. This is what a beaver ancestor looked like. It's a little shrew creature, right? So this is a, an ancestor to rodents, uh, fossils about 60 million years old or something like that. So this is how bees start, beavers started. And somehow, over, over the course of, of several million years, they transformed into this, this creature, right? So the idea here is formally known as niche construction. I pulled this slide off of, uh, I guess, one of Leyland's talk, or present, I don't know. It's, it's an academic slide. I don't really want to go through the jargon, but like the process whereby organisms, through their metabolism activities and their choices, modify their own in each other's niches, this construction may result in changes to one or more natural selection pressures. So that's the key thing. Niche construction can change natural selection pressures. And then they have this nice graphic here. And I don't really care about delta G. Really, I just care that it looks like that. Right? <laughs> so so what, what we see here is that you have this beaver that modifies the environment. The ancestral beaver modifies the environment. That environment is now wetter. It, the, the beaver's interacting with more woody matter, more mud. So that creates a selection pressure on the beaver's body to make it go in a certain way. Right? So the beaver's body gets modified then the beaver can go back and more effectively modify its environment, right? So you get this positive feedback loop where, where the environment and the beaver are both being changed as a result of this interaction, right? So that's, that's another form of the Ouroboros. Um, and so what this gets to is, is another jargony word uh, called organism environment interpenetration, right? And so, so this, is, this is what's captured by this paradox of, of the, the tail in the mouth of the serpent, that you can't really tell what's inside and what's outside. And this is the same thing for, for every living creature on the planet, right? We have semi-permeable membranes, there's all of these niche construction examples, and the point that it's trying to drive home is that you cannot effectively differentiate the organism from the environment in any meaningful way. Right? The organism is about the environment, and the environment is about the organism. So we, we, have, we have these, these, we talk about free will, or you know, we look at our society, and we've got all these roads and bridges, and, and we, we think that, okay, like, you know, we're human beings, and we can just like, affect the world in all these ways, but we don't often recognize how that world feeds back and affects us. So life does not exist in isolation. And despite the fact that, like, in order to be an individuated creature, in order to be yourself, you'd be like, okay, I'm me, like, this is me, that's not me, right? There's, there's this paradox implicit in all of it, that, like, 
who we are is totally contingent on, on everything else that surrounds us. Um, so what's next? Okay, I'm, I'm going to skip over this until the end. Uh, so there's, there's another thing about the Ouroboros about consciousness, but I'll you know, skip that. Um, okay, so now we're going to change gears. Um, and I'm going to talk about a few of my projects and, and how, how this, this idea of the Ouroboros really motivates me to do the things that I do. So this is the logo to the Gleaner's Kitchen, which is a, a dumpster project that I started uh, with Rebecca there. And um, so here, I have a little video that I can show you that I think is good. A big point of the Gleaner's Kitchen is to create a space where other forms of value can be just as easily exchanged. And you know, create a space that facilitates those other forms of value exchange in the same way that banks and PayPal have facilitated monetary exchange. to think of trash in this sort of like all-encompassing category. Trash is anything I don't want. You take everything you don't want and you put it in a pile and wrap a pile of plastic and you send it away. At its core, trash is only trash because people decide that it's useless, not because it actually is useless. Trash is just sort of see myself and everything I do as this sort of like vast recycling plant. And I, I find useful things and I put them where they need to be so that they can be useful and not trash. By taking food out of the dumpster and, and feeding it to people, I'm, I'm providing human society this, this service that it wouldn't otherwise have. So it's like I'm filling in an ecological niche that was not filled. I'm not being a rebel, I'm, I'm filling a hole. Great, okay. Um, so, so I use the word niche there. Um, oh, come on. So, the, for me, right, the, the dumpster is, is this like really crazy metaphor for all of this because it's, um, it's this place that society says like, okay, this is where, this is where the waste goes, right? This is, this is where everything that we don't want is supposed to go. And it turns out that there's value there, that there's incredible value there. We just, we just don't tend to see it. Right? And so by taking that trash and you know, the stuff that comes at the end and bringing it into my body, right? bringing it into myself, I'm, I'm closing this, this, this linear cycle or this linear line, into, in, turning the linear line into a circle um, and, and, and thereby making, making the whole system as a whole more, more sustainable, I guess. I mean, I, I don't want to use all these buzzwords, but there's, there's, just, there's a lot of weight to me in, in the fact that, that all of these things that our society thinks is trash um, are not, not so trashy. Um, so, now let's move on to the next example. So here, y'all have just been drinking some, some nice kombucha, <coughs> and uh, are those sprouts somewhere around? Has everybody gotten some sprouts? Um, so this is a class that I'm teaching this semester, right? We have these nice, nice logos, Evos Fermentarium. Um, so fermentation is this process whereby, yeah, sprouts, we grew these too. I'll, I'm gonna talk about the sprouts right after this. Um, so, fermentation, well, how about you tell me, what's fermentation? The opposite of um, cellular respiration, or? It... Sort of, uh, not quite the opposite, right, so, so the, yeah. It's when there's not enough oxygen, so it can't respirate, so that's ferment. Yeah, 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 so, so that, is, that is the organic chemical definition, right, so these fermentation pathways our pathways, they're, they're respiration pathways that exist without oxygen. So it's breaking sugar into energy without, without the using oxygen. Um, a more broader definition of the word fermentation is the use of microorganisms to digest our food. So what we do in a fermentation process, say with sauerkraut, is you, you chop up the cabbage and you, you put it in an anaerobic environment, right? There's this lack of oxygen. So you add a bunch of salt, and you close it up in a jar <coughs> so there's no oxygen and can't breathe. And then all of the bacteria that are living on the cabbage are just going to go to town, right? And they're going to start breaking down the cellulose and breaking down the sugars in the cabbage. And so it's, it's rot. Like, the, the fer fermented food smells funky because it's, it's literally rotting. But it's rotting under our auspices, right? It's, it's very controlled rotting. And so the, the, the bacteria eat the cabbage, and then we eat the bacteria, and we get all these nutritional benefits, right? So again, we have, we have this Ouroboros, where this process that we think of as death 
is actually quite the opposite. And, and there's, there's many arguments you can make about how fermented foods are, are good for your digestion, they give you micronutrients that eating the raw cabbage wouldn't, and I don't necessarily need to go into all of that. But just the, the point that I want to hammer home is just how, how deeply embedded we are in these ecological processes and how, how the things that we think of as death aren't, aren't really that deadly and that these processes of decay are actually really essential for our living. So this is kombucha, right? So it's made with a SCOBY, which is a symbiotic colony of bacteria and yeast. So you've got all of these different microorganisms and you brew the tea, you add a bunch of sugar. Um, but this didn't taste very sweet, did it? Right, but it was carbonated. So well, the SCOBY transforms that sugar into carbon dioxide and also like it, it produces B vitamins and all these different acids. So it's, it's got a much more complex flavor profile than sugary tea. Right? And you could, you could argue that it's more nutritious. I, I really want to stay away from the nutrition argument for kombucha because there's a lot of bullshit around it. But um, it's, it, the, the point is that like, there's, this is alive. Right? It's, it's a living creature. It's eating the tea and then you eat it and, and the whole system perpetuates itself. Um, so these sprouts are a very similar story. So I don't have the best pictures for these sprouts. But um, here's the, the setup that I have in the lab. Um, so this is the sprouts are growing in this in this hydroponic system. So uh, these are these are literally the sprouts that you just ate. <laughs> I harvested these the other day. This one you're just eating. Um, and so the way they work is they're growing in this cocoa core, which is coconut fiber uh, stuff. And they don't because they're sprouts. They don't really need that much soil because I'm just getting the energy out of the seeds and transforming it to leaves. Um, but you have this problem, this waste problem of once you harvest the sprouts, you've got all these roots. And, and stems and, and, and stuff. And so the way to get around that problem right, is a worm compost. So this is my worm composter. There are some worms up here. You can see them. They're, they're kind of buried in the soil. Um, but the way it works is we take the roots, we put them in the worm composter, and the worms then eat the roots. <coughs> and, and they fertilize the soil, the worm castings. You know, they, they transform the roots into soil. And the process takes about three weeks. And at the end of that three-week period, I just filter the worms out of that soil and put them back in the hydroponic system and, and grow, more, grow more plants. Right? So, so the loop is very, very tight. In most agricultural systems, you can't just have two steps because, because there's just many more species. And, and also, this isn't a closed system because I'm buying seed. Right? So, so I'm inputting seed and I'm taking out the, the greens. But it's the closest thing to, to an Ouroboros that I could build in my tiny little laboratory. Right? You do have this sense of closure where the worms are eating the roots. And, and then the plants are eating the products that the worms make. And then the worms eat the plants, and the plants eat the worms, and it goes back and forth. And, and, and the, pr the production of all that is, is nutrition for me, right? So this, is, this process is present literally everywhere. And we don't tend to see it because we think of progress in this very linear way of like, OK, you know, I'm going to go to Binghamton University, and then I'm going to get a degree, and then I'm going to get a lot of money, and, and, and then you die. And it's, well, you know what? <laughs> um, so, so there's that. Um, I'm going to give you one more example now. Um, so this is this is the big product project that I'm working on. The big collective. Can I just like click on this? We'll just go. It, yeah, um, I have to close it. Yeah. Okay. So this is the the preliminary website to to this collective house um, that Rebecca and I are now living in. It's on the south side of Binghamton. Um, so so the idea here is that, you know, so we're, I'll start with the functional idea. The functional idea is you get a bunch of people living in a house together, sharing food, growing food, um, living, living their lives more intentionally together. Um, the more philosophical idea, right, and this is, this is what I was getting at in, in some of the earlier Ouroboros examples, is that we see throughout the Tree of Life these <coughs> anastomosis events, right, these periods where you have individual creatures coming together and producing a new kind of individual that is, that is of, of, of a, a totally different order than what came before. Right, so you have an alga and a fungus coming together to produce a lichen, right? And you have a chloroplast and, and a host cell coming together to produce the first eukaryotic cells. Um, and so these things happen. They're called major transitions. And my personal belief, right, or the reason why I'm at Binghamton is to try to give scientific credence to this belief, is that human society as a whole is amidst, in the middle of another major transition where we are becoming a superorganism of sorts. And I want to be very intentional about it, very deliberate about it. And so the idea behind the Bing Collective, we, we might actually rename it to the Genome Collective, let me click this link here, um, is that we are structuring what we are doing around the idea that a house can be a living creature. Right? So the house has a genome, 
which is this foundational document like a constitution or a Torah or you know, any, any of these other things that you want to call it. Right? So, so like, think about like, what is a genome? Um, it's this static thing, right? So here's, here's another Ouroboros thing. Right? I had a slide about that, so I'm going to go into this now, right? So like, what is the relationship between the genome and the cell? Right? So the genome is, is this place where, where all the genetic material lies, right? It's this sort of like the inert thing. It's just like a big long crystal. And there's all of these dynamics going around outside it that like allow the cell to actually function, right? So the genome is the entire cell, right? It, every, everything that the cell is must be encoded in the genome or it wouldn't be there, right? This is the genetic determinism that we learn. Um, but it's, so there's this, this sort of part whole paradox where the genome represents the entire thing and yet it is only a part of the thing. Um, and so we see this pattern in life all the time that like you need, you, you have this sort of like nested hierarchy that it's tangled up, right? So this is the Ouroboros again, that the inside like part is actually the whole thing and I'm, it's very difficult to explain. It's like very counterintuitive. Um, so, so our house has a genome, right? And, and sure, it's like a document that says like, you know, Maximus must do the dishes on Monday or something like that, but it's a lot more than that, right? It contains all of the, 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 the cultural, any cultural information that can be crystallized into text is in the genome, and it's going to inform the way the organism functions in some way. Um, and I believe that by structuring an organization like this around the dynamics of a living thing, that we'll have a better chance of, of having it work well, because living things have been working well for four billion years. Um, so I think I'll end there. I'd love to take some questions. Yeah? Uh, like, what do you expect to see as an end result? Um, well, I expect to be living a life that I find meaningful um, and, and sustainable, right? And so that means, yeah, economically sustainable, um, but also just like emotionally sustainable and, and you know, I think that, that as humans we really, really need community and need to feel like we are part of something that is bigger than ourselves. Um, and, and so the, the end result that I'd like to see is, is, is really cultivating that experience and, and living in a house where everyone feels like they are part of something bigger. Yeah? Um, when you are going through the trash and doing all that, like, how do you, do you have like a process of discerning like what's healthy to eat or do you like, I don't know, like what's your process in that? Yeah, um, so, yes, <laughs> uh, the, you know, so one, one thing that I'll, I'll often say is like, we have been determining with our senses what food is good and what food is bad for four billion years, or like if you want to say like how long we've been humans, so two million years, whatever it is, it's a really long time. Uh, and it's only in the last century or so that the FDA has come along and said, oh, oh, you know, there's that date on that piece of plastic, and depending on what those symbols say, like that's going to define whether or not you can eat that food. Uh, so a lot of it's just using your senses and, and you know, trying to remember what, what food was before it was wrapped in plastic and packaging. Yeah? How many people do you plan to get in the About nine, um, for now. We'll, we'll see how that goes. But yeah, we have open applications. So if this is something that you're interested in, we have four more spots. How long do you expect these people to live there? Um, that's a good question. Uh, so one, one thing about organisms that I think is really, really important to keep in mind is, is how, how these cycles move the material through. Right? So you're eating these sprouts now, and you know, in, in a day or two days they'll be in your toilet, or part of them will be in your toilet. Right? And we hear these like, strange facts about, oh, you know, every atom in your body is replaced every seven years, which is not true, but like, the, the essence of it is true, that like, what we are is not this material, it's not the specific material that makes us up, it's, it's the process that that material allows to occur. Um, and so organisms are constantly replacing themselves. Serpents shed their skin, right? And, and the same ought to be true of the house. That the house itself is designed to, to exist indefinitely, <coughs> but the people within it are expected to come and go, right? And so the idea is you create a structure, you know, like this university, you, you come in as a freshman, you leave as a senior, this university stays the same. Um, so the idea is to create a structure where people can, can move in and move out, and yet something constant remains, some identity remains intact. Yeah? Is economics like part of this circle factor here, or is that just outside? Yeah, I mean, I can, it's very easy for, for me to you know, be an anti-capitalist anarchist. And, uh, I've, had to, I've had to temper that a lot in the last few years, um, because 
econo I mean, economic, like what, what money is, is this like really amazing way of quantifying value, right? And keeping track of where everything is. And so if you can balance a budget, that means that the energetics underneath it ought to be also balanced. And we have all these, these problems with it because the market is out of balance and money doesn't really seem to be an accurate indicator of value more generally or of, of thermodynamic energy even, but it's the best indicator we have. And so, yes, economics needs to be a part of this. So the house, we're, we're starting a number of businesses, right? So, so here's, here's a fermentation business. Um, we've got some mushrooms growing in the basement. Uh, a lot of agricultural work because, because it's really important. You know, food autonomy is so, so important. And, and the idea of autonomy of like, okay, we're, we're producing the things that sustain us. Um, so the idea is that for the house to, to have a, a number of little cottage industries that, that allow it to, to keep going. Yeah. Um, how would this house deal with like conflict or selfishness or what if Maximus <laughs> uh, th That is the biggest challenge, like by, by far the biggest challenge. I wish I had a concise answer for that. Um, it's really hard and I think, I think that the reason why we live the way we live today in our separate apartments with, with all of our economic autonomy and everybody makes enough money to buy their food and do all these things is because human relationships are really susceptible to cheating and to, to all of those kinds of things. And we've sort of forgotten how to live together in close-knit groups because we've just found it easier to build a bunch of walls around ourselves and be like, okay, I don't have to compromise with you because like, I have my little thing. And, and, and I don't want to do that, right? I don't want to just surround myself in a little bubble. And so it means putting myself in some really difficult social situations where there are, there are people who have desires that I really wish they didn't have. And, and you got to work through it and talk a lot. And decisions take forever. And you have to make sure that everybody is heard. And, and it's, it's not efficient, but I think it's really important, maybe the most important. I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> um, well. Thank you guys for, for listening and, and giving me a chance to sort of talk my ear off like this. I, <laughs> it was really nice. Have a safe spring break. Um, yeah, and if you, if you want more kombucha, come to Science 3. We have gallons and gallons of it. <laughs>